Socialism is not good in theory, despite what you'll hear from people like Second Thought, but even opponents of socialism repeat this lie. So here's why it's impossible for socialism to ever work. Socialism is a society in which the means of production are held by all in common and subject to democratic decision making. Let's unpack that. First, the means of production, also called factors of production, are goods that are used to make consumers' goods. So a car can be considered a consumer's good because it's directly purchased and used by the consumer. And some factors of production for a car would be the metal used for the body, the rubber used for the tires, and so on. Also included as a factor of production would be the labour required to arrange these resources into the final state of a car. So we can define socialism in a more concise manner as the abolition of private property in the factors of production. The essential mark of socialism is that one will alone act. It is immaterial whose will it is. The director might be an anointed king or dictator, ruling by virtue of his charisma. He may be a fewer or a board of fewers appointed by the vote of the people. The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. One will alone chooses, decides, directs, acts, and gives orders. The distinctive mark of socialism is the oneness and indivisibility of the will directing all production activities within the whole social system. The problem with this is that without private property in the factors of production, entrepreneurs cannot know their most value productive arrangement. Allow me to explain. Without private property, there is no trading of the factors, and therefore there is no prices for those factors, and therefore you cannot conduct profit-loss calculations. Consider a man in a socialist society who wants to build a railroad from city A to city B, but there is a mountain in the way. Going through the mountain would require more engineering because you have to design the tunnel, and going around it would require more steel because it's a longer route. Which should he choose for the good of the nation? It seems he's left with an entirely arbitrary choice, not one based upon the relative scarcities of steel as opposed to engineering. On the other hand, a greedy capitalist who wants to build from city C to city D is easily able to find the most value productive route. He simply compares the prices of the two routes and picks the cheaper one. Not only does this benefit him in minimising his costs, but in minimising his costs he actually frees up the rarer bundle of resources for other people to use. This is because on the market prices are not arbitrarily slapped on there by the owner, rather they represent how much people want that item. Consider a car chassis. Should you construct it out of steel or titanium or carbon fibre composites or something else entirely? An engineer might say that the carbon fibre is the best choice because it's strong and lightweight. What he isn't considering is that carbon fibre is required for certain other applications, whereas here we can get away with lower grade materials. On the market, those people whose projects absolutely 100% require the fancier materials will bid up the price such that budget manufacturers aren't willing to pay for it anymore, so they go for cheaper materials like aluminium. In other words, if you're making a loss, this shows that others understand how to make a better use of the goods in question. The socialist central planner cannot conduct these profit loss calculations, called economic calculation, because he does not have access to prices for the factors of production. In the words of Mises, he is groping in the dark. So here we arrive at the impossibility thesis this summarised as follows. 1. Without private property in the factors of production, they cannot be traded. 2. If the factors cannot be traded, there can be no factor prices. 3. If there are no factor prices, economic calculation is impossible. In other words, a socialist economy is strictly an impossibility. The central planner cannot compare the efficiencies of different lines of production in order to pick the best one. When a capitalist entrepreneur makes a mistake by building his cars out of titanium instead of steel, he knows he's doing something wrong because he's losing money, and he knows where he's losing money as well. Moreover, this provides us with a type of natural selection which pushes us towards better and better entrepreneurs. Those entrepreneurs who are better at finding the most efficient line of production will outlast those who are worse at it, so you should expect the market to tend towards the most efficient line of production for any given product. Of note here is that the impossibility thesis is not of the form, boy howdy it sure would be difficult for a central planner to get all the information he needs to plan effectively, rather it's of the form it's literally impossible for the central planner to even begin to get the first bit of information to plan effectively. The former is a different problem, called the knowledge problem, essentially saying that the knowledge people use to plan their own lives is initially distributed and it can't be effectively collected up by a central planner. The knowledge problem isn't per se unsolvable, you might overcome it with enough computation or sci-fi tech, but the impossibility thesis called the economic calculation problem cannot be solved no matter how much tech or computation you throw at it. Consider the analogy of finding the average weight of an adult unicorn. Unicorns don't exist so we don't know what properties they would have so therefore you can't begin the calculation to find the average weight of one. This problem could not be resolved by purchasing a better calculator. The issue isn't that the computation is super difficult to do, it's that you can't begin the computation because you have no data to compute with. Figuring out what people want is the knowledge problem. Figuring out how to produce what people want is the economic calculation problem. The first is fantastically difficult, the second is impossible. A number of proposed solutions to this problem have been forwarded by socialists, 
The first of which is gross output planning, practiced by the Soviet Union. Each ministry that oversaw an industry was given a certain target, a certain amount of nails to produce, a certain amount of chandeliers to produce, a certain amount of tractors to produce, a certain amount of gasoline. And then each industry head then went and allocated to all different factories, the factory managers, they were given targets. This gross output planning was not sufficient to solve the problem, however. There were a lot of structures in the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, industrial buildings and, and homes that were completely finished and ready for people to move in, except they didn't have any, any roofs on them, okay? Why did they have any roofs? They didn't have any roofs on them because the nail industry only produced very big nails very he heavy, big nails. They didn't produce the smaller roofing nails that you need in construction. Why did they do that? Because it was easier, because the target was given in terms of tons. So the bigger the nails you produced, okay, um, uh, producing bigger nails was, e was easier to do to, f to, to fulfill your target of certain tons of nails. Women complete, c continuously complained that there was no clothing to fit them, petite women in the Soviet Union. The reason? Because the um, uh, apparel industry, was uh, they were given a target in terms of yards of cloth. So everybody made huge dresses, okay? Um, and, and it was very difficult to get children's clothing for that reason. Whereas in, t in, in a capitalist economy, of course, you have prices, okay? The, 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 if there's few children's cl clothing or, 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 for, or, or not enough clothing for petite women, not enough dresses and so on, the price of those things shoot up, right? It's high profits to be made and resources are shifted. In the end, the only way the USSR was able to stay afloat for even such a short period of time was by copying prices found elsewhere in the world where socialism hadn't completely enthralled industry. Of course, these external prices were not accurate representations of scarcities within the Soviet Union, and this still leaves us with no solution should the central planners be so successful that they manage to attain world socialism. The post-Keynesian economist Joan Robinson proposed a steady state economy as a solution to the ECP, essentially keeping all lines of production static just the way they were on the final day of capitalism. The problem here is that this is no solution at all. You still rely on the capitalist economy to demonstrate those lines to be efficient in the first place. And should any changes occur over the time that you run your socialist experiment, society will be incapable of detecting and reacting to these changes. In that sense, you still do not have a socialist economy. Rather, you plug your ears and pretend that society is in perpetual stasis. Meanwhile, real-world conditions steadily creep away from your initial conditions, leaving your lines of production with ever-weakening efficiency. Phillips and Rosworski argue in the People's Republic of Walmart that big companies such as Amazon and Walmart already operate internal centrally planned economies which are bigger than the Soviet Union, thus proving that the ECP is surmountable. But both Walmart and Amazon do have factor prices. They don't get everything for free. They have to pay for it. There is, however, a kernel of truth to this argument. As a company grows in size and swallows up more and more factors of production, there is this ever-growing internal socialism. That is, they do not have internal factor prices. And as this company keeps growing, it will be ever less efficient at allocating means which implies that a natural monopoly is strictly impossible. A large gigafirm which controls all of the widget production would struggle to allocate means in the exact same way that the Soviet Union did. This implies that it could not maintain any sort of dominant position for very long at all, as any smaller competition would be far more apt to find the most value-productive uses for different factors. Moreover, this internal socialism is still just that internal. Should any firm come to own all of the factors of production, there will be no external prices to use, so a pure socialist economy remains impossible. The only way out of this pit is for the socialist to grit his teeth, admit that his society could not advance beyond a hunter-gatherer level, and say that it's still better because of a quality or whatever. But there remains a defeat even to the knowledgeable socialist who accepts the calculational chaos that would ensue, because the socialist ethic cannot make for a human ethic. Let's consider what the claim that factors should be commonly owned by all would entail. First we note that the owner of a thing is he who has complete and final say over how that thing is to be used. Consider the example of Crusoe and Friday on an island. Crusoe owns a stick and he wishes to use it for spearfishing, but Friday wants to use that same stick to stoke his fire. These actions cannot take place simultaneously, so if one action goes forth, it necessarily excludes the other. Therefore, only one person is able to win the conflict over its use. The owner of the stick, Crusoe in this case, is said to be the one who should win any conflict over its use. So here, Crusoe should be allowed to use it to spearfish, and Friday should not be allowed to use it to stoke his fire. How ownership comes into being is of prime importance here. 
Under true ethics, which are detailed in this video, ownership is granted to the initial possessor of a thing, until such a time that he decides to trade it or abandon it. This initial possession is called homesteading, and this prior later distinction is presupposed by anyone who would have a conflict over anything. Imagine A is the initial possessor of Alpha and B initiates a conflict over its use. B is presupposing that he should own it instead of A, but implied in B owning Alpha is that other people shouldn't have the right to take Alpha for themselves. So B is presupposing that should control of Alpha be wrestled away from him by C, he would still own it. C would not own it. That is to say, B presupposes that ownership and possession are distinct. But what is implied in the idea that the right to possess, ownership that is, is distinct from mere possession. It means that if there is any ownership at all, and those who quarrel over things are all asserting different ownership claims and thus presupposing ownership and its distinction from possession, then it does not accrue merely to those who take things from others. That is, if B takes a thing by force from A, this cannot in and of itself make B the owner. Why? Because if it did, it means that C could take it from B and thereby become the owner. This just means that there is no such thing as ownership, there is only possession. Might makes right so to speak. But this contradicts the presumption that ownership and possession are different. From this very simple idea, we can see that the entire Lockean idea of first use first own follows. Why? Because if taking some good by force from its previous possessor is not sufficient to ground an ownership claim, then by Misesian style or regression it becomes obvious that only the first possessor slash user can have an ownership claim. Every other person takes it from a previous possessor and is thus a mere possessor, not an owner. The first possessor, the person who plucks the resource from its unowned state out of the commons, is the only possessor who does not take it from someone else. This is why first possession imbues the homesteader with the unique status of ownership, i.e. the first user and possessor of a good is either its owner or he is not. If he is not, then who is? The person who takes it from him by force? If forcefully taking a possession from a prior owner entitles the new possessor to the thing, then there is no such thing as ownership, but only mere possession. But such a rule, that a later user may acquire something by taking it from the previous owner, does not avoid conflicts, it rather authorises them. In other words, we can see not only that Lockean homesteading is inextricably bound up with a prior later distinction and opposed to the latecomer ethic, but that the very idea of ownership implies that only libertarian style ownership is justifiable. The socialist ethic fails on the further grounds that it implies group ownership, but group ownership itself implies a contradiction. Suppose that a set of people, A through Z, commonly own a stick. What is to be done about a dispute over the stick between members in this set? Say that A wants to use the stick to spearfish, but B does not want the stick used in this way. Under the assumption that they both own it, they should both justly win the dispute. So the spearfishing is simultaneously just and unjust, a contradiction. Some advocates of group ownership attempt to sidestep this by having a group decision-making process. Say that all the members take a vote and the majority decide that it should be used to spearfish. This would imply that anyone who lost the vote did not own the stick as they were determined to be the just losers in the dispute. But to say that they do not own the stick contradicts the assumption that every member of the set owns the stick. There exists no way out of this. Group ownership simply cannot solve for conflicts between group members. Furthermore, we turn to Second Thought's laughable claim that The central idea that unites all socialists is maximizing freedom. His claim is that under capitalism the boss has all the power, leaving his workers helpless but to obey his every whim, citing one's wage as an arbitrarily chosen sum. Your paycheck isn't determined by how good a job you do, but by what your boss decides it to be. This argument is quite hilarious in that a wage is only truly arbitrary if you do not have private property and factors. Recall above that labour was one of the factors factors production, so it's only under socialism that the price attached to labour, i.e. the wage, is arbitrarily chosen by the will that plans. Moreover, a capitalist entrepreneur who hires labourers cannot get away with paying whatever wage he pleases. If that was the case, why would he pay any money at all? For as much as socialists like to paint entrepreneurs as having insatiable greed, it's odd that they would ever temper this hunger to give anyone anything in exchange, ever. Far from an arbitrary decision by the capitalist, one's wage is determined the same way the price for anything is determined on the market through a bidding mechanism. Just as I cannot sell a coffee mug for a trillion ounces of gold, I can't sell my labour for that much. It's simply not what it's worth. The flip side is that I also cannot purchase a coffee mug for a single penny or get one for free. And the same goes for labour. If I want someone to work a till for me, I have to bid for their labour against all of my competitors. I might want to pay them only 50 cents an hour, but then my competition raises the bid to a dollar. I respond by raising it to two dollars, and so on. This bidding process is limited by the productivity of that person in that particular line of work. 
If I expect that them working the till will net me an extra $7 per hour, I'm not going to be willing to pay them any more than that. Therefore, we should expect this person's wage to tend towards $7 an hour for till working. This is why minimum wage policies create involuntary unemployment. If the minimum wage is set at $10 an hour, this till worker is going to be hard pressed to find anyone who's willing to hire them for that price. Furthermore, both the worker and the capitalist perceive this relationship to be beneficial, else the loser would not accept the trade. To elaborate, consider the differing time preferences between the worker and the capitalist. A time preference is how much one values a present good over a future good. So a person with a relatively high time preference might eat a potato right now, whereas a person with a lower time preference would plant that potato, wait 6 months and he'll have 10 potatoes. The low time preference man values the 10 potatoes 6 months from now higher than the 1 potato now, and vice versa for the high time preference man. This is one reason why capitalists are able to hire workers. For instance, I might expect that I can sell my 1 tonne of lumber for 100 ounces of gold upstream, but I first have to transport it up upstream. I expect that the task would take 3 workers 10 hours to complete, and that I'd need to wait a further 50 hours in order to find a buyer. I find 3 such workers who are willing to do the job at 20 ounces of gold each, and they receive payment immediately upon delivery to my warehouse. A further 50 hours pass and I do indeed find a buyer who pays me the 100 ounces. So I have netted 40 ounces of gold, and each worker only 20. So why on earth do the workers agree to this arrangement? For a start, I will have had to expend capital in getting the one tonne of lumber cut and processed in the first place, which comes out of my cut. Second, I only get my 40 ounces after waiting 50 hours after the workers have already been paid. This requires a relatively low time preference. Third, the capitalist takes on all of the risk. Each of the workers know that they'll definitely be getting their 20 ounces, whether a buyer can be found or not. For instance, it might not take 50 hours, but instead 300 hours to find a buyer. And perhaps by that point, a massive surge in the supply of lumber means that I can only get 60 ounces of gold for it. In this case, I have made no money whatsoever, whilst each of the workers walk away with their 20 ounces apiece. Furthermore, Second Thought claims that another problem with capitalism is that it's anti-democratic. He's correct that it's anti-democratic, but this isn't a problem. A democratic outcome does not imply an ethical one. To demonstrate, consider the following. 10 people are on an island and 9 of those people want to gang rape the remaining person. Putting this to a vote would yield that the rape should indeed go forth, so we found an instance of just rape under the democratic ethic. In fact, any mob based crime is determined to be just by democracy, by the nature of democracy as mob rule. Throughout Second Thought's video, you notice a pattern of find a problem, blame capitalism, and claim socialism would solve that problem. He does this time and time again, for instance claiming that the housing crisis is caused by capitalism when in fact we know it's the fault of fiduciary media introduced by aggressive state legislation. This cycle of blaming capitalism for every woe in the world is nothing more than a dishonest grift, and to understand why, you have to watch this video by Mentis Wave.